Africa. What is that? Basically, uh, the Dutch Netherlands. Uh, it, it you know, it's it's Roman the Netherlands. You know, because you know the Dutch got all the way to the Rhine. They go a little bit further up. So I want to investigate the Romans in in Holland, and that seemed to be something that I wanted to do. So I took this class. Uh, it was called Mediterranean Cities. And uh, it was the person in charge. His name was Dr. Charles Rizzi, wonderful man. And the goal of the class was that everybody chooses a city out of antiquity and they follow the course of that city uh, throughout time, all the way up uh, into the, the period of time around the Renaissance. You know? So that's kind of the idea. Everybody gets to choose a city. And the idea is that when you meet every time, uh, because it's kind of a symposium-like conversational course, you basically, everybody's in charge of that of their own city. So you start off and, and you ask the question, so what's going on in Alexandria uh, between 200 to 100 BCE? Oh, that's pretty interesting. What's going on politically, economically, in a religious sense, okay? What's going on in Athens right now? You chose Athens, right? What's going on now between 200 and 100 BCE? Oh, that's what's going on politically, economically. You know, you, you know. So you see where we're going with this, okay? So every every class meeting, we do another hundred years, right? Okay. So I planned, I planned Trier. <laughs> I'm doing Trier. <laughs> we're going to follow Trier all the way through. Uh, because by I mean, by golly, I'm doing, you know, Roman <laughs> in Carmania and Fury. <laughs> this is so bad. So my professor comes up to me, Dr. Frizzi, and he says, you know, do you really want to do Trier? I said, yeah. You know, there's not a lot of materials at a certain point. Why don't you do Ephesus? Oh, okay. Well, why? Well, nobody else is doing Ephesus. Okay, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll do Ephesus. Go, oh, thank you. It's a great city. Trust me, you'll love it. Oh, okay. So, so as we're going through this course, apparently the other students didn't want to do their work. And so as we're going the rounds through cities, theirs became shorter and shorter, and we're leaving class too early. So Dr. Fazit came up and said, you know, can you, can you elaborate more? I know you like to talk. Can you make it longer? Just prepare a little bit more. So by the end of the semester, it was a class on Ephesus. <laughs> so so I, I, you know, I had all this great material. And I even got credit officially as a student preceptor for the course. Wow, that's pretty amazing. So it becomes master's time. What are you going to do? I'm going to do, you guys got this right. Germani inferior. <laughs> and um, Dr. Frizzi says, you know, let me be head of your committee. Maybe you want to uh, do Ephesus. I said, why? Well, because you amassed so much material. <laughs> You've already got a great start on it. I said, oh, okay, well, sure, I'll go with it. So uh, I start writing my master's thesis. They were very you know, uh, people being added to it and they got longer and longer and longer and, and years start going by and 997 pages later, uh, the longest master's thesis in California State University uh, of Fullerton history. Uh, I finally finished this master's thesis on Ephesus in four volumes. <laughs> <laughs> and it is a walking tour as you're going through the city of Ephesus as if you're in the middle of the second century. I'm telling you, and of course, from there, I learned the significance of Artemis of the Ephesians, that really Artemis was synonymous with the idea of Ephesus. They are, the two are really one. Uh, but you know, I didn't focus completely on that. That was, that was the end point. And my thesis statement was, of course, Pausanias statement, uh, the thesis of why uh, Ephesus was important, and of course Artemis was the center of that. Okay, so I'm learning Greek and Latin. I'm going to UCI, and you know what I'm going to do my uh, my PhD work on. That's right, I'm doing it on the catacombs. 
<laughs> you got it. You figure that out. So I'm like, okay, we're doing the catacombs now. Uh, and um, then, you know, something happened that never happens uh, in academia. Scholars start fighting each other. It, it's really a surprise. And you start fighting over what the materials are. And, and um, I became pretty upset. There's, there's a fight between the historians in one department and the classicists on the other. And the historian says, yes, I can use these sources. And the classicists actually tell me I can't use certain sources. And they want to be more literary. And the historian, really, there's like a civil war between the two. I'm going, this is great. I'm feeling really down and out. And, I, and uh, my friend invites me to an event. And uh, it was a, a meeting together of, of, of uh, it was the, um, um, I'm trying to remember what the media I should remember right off the top of my head. Uh, it was the, oh, uh, the Society of Biblical Literature uh, meeting at Claremont, uh, was the SPL. So I arrived there, I'm really sad and upset. And, and, um, and um, you know, I'm hearing Marvin Meyer speaking, you know, and, and he comes up to me, actually, I see him from afar. He walks up to me, very famous scholar, uh, translating the Gospel of Thomas, uh, Gospel of Judas guy. Uh, you know, he's, he's very, he worked on the Nag Hammadi. And he actually sees me, talks to me first and invites me out to eat with him, which is pretty great. So we were having a conversation and he says, so what are your areas to talk about? He says, ooh, Artemis, that's good. Uh, then um, <clears throat> then um, I come back and the guy by the name of Sam Chadwick says the same thing. Hey, this is really good. Why don't you, and Sam and Marvin and the others are all talking. I didn't know what was going on behind closed doors. All I know is all of a sudden they pushed me in front of the head of the school of religion. Uh, her name is uh, Karen Torgerson. And they said, just go ahead and tell them, uh, you know, you're doing Artemis of the Ephesians. Like, okay. So, so I so I talk with her and I talk about my master's thesis and I talk about Artemis of the Ephesians. And she says, So you're gonna do your PhD work here? I said, uh it's like, is that I'm not sure that's a question or a statement. <laughs> I said, I said uh, yeah, you do an Artemis of the Ephesians, welcome to Claremont. So I got into Claremont Graduate University in uh, I'd say maybe between 30 to 35 minutes. And we'll take care of the rest. So apparently I'm doing Artemis. <laughs> so you can guess my PhD work was an Artemis, uh, the Ephesians. And then I ended up going uh, to Ephesus and spending a lot of time there. Over the years, I clocked about being in Ephesus in the general area of almost eight months, if you count all the times. So I have you know, been there. I've spent time uh, with, you know, well, the first time I was there, you know, I was this outsider, uh, you know, you know, the archaeologist, right? You know. But then you got a new person by the name of Sabine, okay, and I became an insider. <laughs> and so I'm working with them and I got a chance and all these great opportunities. Uh, wow. And then I got to work with the American archaeologists as well as the Turkish archaeologists. And that led uh, me to take my dissertation and make it into a book, which is still available, although the price is way high right now, I noticed. It's pretty it's cheaper on Kindle. At the same time, more people buy it, go back down to 65, so I don't know what to say. Okay, end of book plug, because I, you know, that would be, uh, that would be rather shameless of me to, to plug a book. I would, I would, I would never do that, uh, especially uh, through the medium of Zoom. Uh, this, this, this will never happen. Um, I have dignity. So, uh, anyway, moving right along. So that brings us to the topic at hand. Uh, and, uh, it's, and, and of course, the first thing people are going to ask is, still, why is this important at all? What, what, you know, it's just an obscure goddess. Why am I even here? So I'm going to give you 10 reasons why you're here. How's that? <laughs> 10 reasons why this topic is important. Here we go. First of all, uh, as we shall discuss in a few moments, the entire belief system devoted to Artemis of the Ephesians from ancient times has been largely deciphered from cult objects and rituals to their calendar and personal beliefs. Now, I, I, I want to I sink in a little bit. You're like, oh, you've got to be exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> what you're, if you have my book, you know, 
Uh, where is my information coming from? Not from secondary sources, coming from the Ephesians themselves. Apparently they have this prolific problem of inscribing everything everywhere. They just don't stop. You cannot believe how many inscriptions they have and how meticulous they are in describing every single thing they're doing, even right to the, uh, the position of where they're standing. It's, it's almost ridiculous. Uh, the other archaeologists at Ephesus know this, but the world really doesn't know this. And I think it should be known. And the problem is, is that I, I've seen lots of books of Artemis of the Ephesians, and the information is still scattered, except, of course, you know, book. Otherwise, you find a little here, a little there. And see, and, and when it comes to ancient times, most people say, well, we know early, we know Judaism, and we know early Christianity, and we know, uh, you know, the imperial cult. Uh, we're, that's getting pretty well known now. So the, the Roman imperial cult, um, some of the mystery cults, some of them here and there, but the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians, uh, that's that's kind of a, kind of a big deal. Uh, and and of course, obviously, I look at it from a historical as well as an anthropological perspective, and obviously an archaeological, and as a scholar of religion. And yes, we'll go through that. So we 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 know everything from even what kind of wine they poured what kind of incense they used, uh, down to not only the cult rituals, but uh, right down to everybody's names. We mean everybody's names. Okay. Oh, this is how much we know. This is, this is really bad. Um, we know, uh, for example, uh, in the Britannium, uh, those uh, who did uh, the offerings, yeah, we know their names. I'll just kind of give you a little, little sample here. Uh, we know that uh, if you're, if I'll just, I'll just throw out a date, around 54 uh, CE, we know that the Hierop Kirx, uh, who is the announcer, we know his name is Monatus. Yep, yep, Monatus, he was there from, you know, 41 to 54. We know that the person uh, who did uh, the uh, flute, uh, you know, uh, uh, blew the flute uh, during the, the offerings, we know that uh, if we're still using 54, we know that person is Mithras. Uh, and we know the Hieroscopus. Uh, he's the person who reads the entrails. He, we know his name around that time is Marcus. So, you know, it's Medatus, Metris, and Marcus. I call them the three M's. <laughs> These are their names. In fact, I can go on. Medatus is followed by uh, Epicrates and so forth. Before him is Grainy as Capto. I'm telling you, you know everything. It's ridiculous how much we know. Or if you want to do the spon uh, the spondulus, the flute offering person, Alexandros is before, uh, Parasius is after that, and Trophimus. Are you guys getting my point yet? Right? Okay, so I've got their names. So I can I can make a list of their names uh, for hundreds of years. Is this good? You guys learning things pretty quick? And we know exactly how they did the offerings. We know exactly even how they cut the meat. We know exactly who bought the meat. <laughs> we know the prayers, we know the hymns, we know when they sang the hymns. Are you guys liking this? We even know who stood in what position on the processions, who followed the other. Uh, we know, I'm going to give away some of the mysteries today. Woohoo! Is this fun, right? <laughs> yeah, it's too much fun uh, at the playground for scholars. Okay, and we have many here today. Second, oh yeah, we're on number two, right? Second, uh, the cult of Artemis Ephesia is not just a random belief system from antiquity. Uh, it was considered one of the most important belief systems in the Greco-Roman world, even receiving mention in the Bible with the magic words connected to this belief system, understood as the most powerful in the world, according to many of those living around the Mediterranean at that era. Uh, even Clement of Alexandria. This is, I mean, it's amazing of how many people would say this. Okay, well, so obviously many of you are, are, are connected or are interested in biblical studies, so I'll go ahead and just read this little part here. According to the Acts of the Apostles, Demetrius the silversmith instigated a riot in protest against the Apostle Paul, who he believed was not only bent upon the destruction of their way of life in Ephesus, but who was also insulting their goddess, whom they all served. He declared, and there is danger 
not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be scorned and she will be deprived of her majesty that brought all Asia and the world to worship her. Stop there for a moment. According to the New Testament, the book of Acts, all the world is, is worshiping Artemis. It's kind of an interesting testimony, right? <laughs> of, when it comes to gravitas. It's a great source for that. We keep on going. As the angry mob gained momentum, the city was filled with confusion. The crowd knew exactly where to go. Rushing into the theater were all shouted as one greatest Artemis of the Ephesians for two hours straight. A long time. In order to quell the, the disturbance, the town clerk instructed those assembled, saying, oh, no. Citizens of Ephesus, who is there that does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the statue that fell from heaven? Since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, unquote. Isn't this interesting? Because the image. So you see already some important parts of, of Artemis of the Ephesians just from the New Testament. You're seeing that the image is also important. You're seeing that the city is directly connected and their patronage and their pride is connected directly to Artemis uh, herself, right? And of course, you can see the economic aspect, right? You know, the, the trade, the pilgrimages. Because remember, uh, the Ephesus was the site of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which is the Temple of Artemis, which is, of course, connected to Artemis. Okay, so you have already this concept of a universal goddess, uh, the fame even testified by the New Testament. You have others, too, like Pausanias. Uh, he wrote a travelogue in the second century. He says, all cities, the quote from him, worship Artemis of Ephesus. And individuals hold her in honor above all the gods. Well, that's an interesting testimony, unquote, because it comes from somebody who wrote a travelogue of ancient Greece, mainland Greece, going through all of the gods of mainland Greece. And yet after all that, still says this is the, this is the most important one over here, right? That is, so th that's a kind of a big, big deal. And we find evidence of that all over. We have so many images that have survived uh, of Artemis of the Ephesians spread out throughout the Mediterranean world. We find them on the shores of Gaul, France. We, we find them uh, in, in uh, Britannia or, or, or you know, the area of England. We find them uh, in Vermont, in Germany. That's off the, <laughs> the, the ancient mainstream thing. Uh, we, we find them, I guess I say Illyria, I'll count. Uh, we find them in, in North Africa. We find them in Egypt. We find them all over, all places, uh, Palestine, Caesarea Maritima, uh, by Jerusalem. We find them all over Anatolia. We find them along the coasts, uh, coastline of, of the Black Sea. They're everywhere. And we also realize something, because we'll see this. You're going, but Dr. Rietveld, how come we don't, we don't have tons and tons of writings about it? We actually do have tons and tons of writings about it, but not accessible uh, to the English-speaking world. <laughs> and a lot of it is still in Greek. But at the same time, let's be honest, the cult of Isis was more popular with the literati, the upper echelon. So, that was, so Isis was the, 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 the goddess, the universal goddess for them. Although parts of Isis will merge with Artemis, you'll see that. But still, right? You still have that. But I'll be honest. Artemis is the goddess of the common clay. I'm serious. She's a, she's a goddess of, yeah, silversmiths, coppersmiths, and metal workers, maybe because of the connection with the Idean backpiles or these mystical, magical metal workers, okay? But she is also connected to just those who are the, the I think I say the middle class because that's problematic when it comes to the ancient times, but those people who are not so wealthy, but that who are merchants. And you know what happens with merchants? They travel everywhere, <laughs> no places, but not merchants and people in uh, who are involved in various commercial enterprises. She's popular with farmers and fertility in that sense. So she's it's the common rabble, which by the way, 
is evidenced even within the book of Acts. Remember, it's the common people who are rising up. It's the silversmiths, right? You know, our trade. So, so that's why we find less uh, in these in these various uh, areas. But we also have to realize that there, there's something called the the Gramata, Ephesian Gramata. And the, these are the sacred words, the magical words connected to Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so um, uh, what's interesting about this is these words, uh, aske, kataske, lix, tetrax, dunamis, taosi, these ancient words, which I knew too fast, uh, were considered the most magical words in antiquity, according to people at that time. And they were directly connected to Artemis of the Ephesians, said to be even on her cult statue. Is this interesting? But we do find, find evidence of, of these words or, 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 or a progression of these words. Uh, sometimes they just have the first letter and the Greek alphabet to represent each word, each sound. We find this all over the place. It is, it, it is pretty amazing. Uh, and, and, and I've done research on this, and it turns out these words go all the way back uh, to the 5th century BCE. And I go through the, inscri and the inscriptions of all places. They were real popular in Sicily and Southern Italy, but they're connected uh, to Artemis of the Ephesians uh, pretty early on. And, and so you not only get this universal goddess conception, you got this, you know, she has great magic. Why the, why the Ephesian letters, as you call it, are so important is again, it's the common, common rabble, the common clay. What do you mean by that? Well, in magic, and many of you know, study, uh, there, there's so many elaborate <laughs> recipes of how to do things. And people, they get kind of lazy. <laughs> they go, can we have like a catch-all for everything? Like, you know, you know, one that's going to work for fertility, one that's going to work for marriage. Can we have one? You know, the, the ultimate abracadabra. So the Ephesian letters become that abracadabra, the ultimate. So I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, there's an example where this person is in the fighting match, uh, and um, he's fighting against a contender. He puts the 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 uh, the amulet of the Ephesian letters on his on around his leg, and he beats the guy in seven bouts. Hey, hey you know, athletic victory. Thank you, Ephesian letters. These other people uh, were wanting to get married. Okay, well you're going to have. Uh, the priest recite the Ephesian letters going clockwise around you as a protection against what? Anything that will uh, stop fertility. Because, you know, when you get married those days, it's like, hey, where's the baby? <laughs> is it a boy? You gotta remember, that's that period. You got to protect the womb. And so you do this a circumlocution, you know, because they're saying the words as you're going around to, you know, protect them because these words were also used against fighting, yes, demons. Uh, interesting thing about uh, the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians, it has a has an elaborate demonology. Yeah, so, you know, they're, they're demons. There's, you know, there's evil spirits that Artemis has used uh, to, to protect you from. And so uh, she is a demon slayer, a demon fighter. Isn't that fascinating? So you use the Ephesian letters in that way. And the Ephesian letters are also uh, used to... Uh, to uh, not only protect people and help people make them win their battles, uh, but they're also used for, for protection when they go out to sea and everything else. You can, you can, you can you better realize why important, how important these ideas are. Is this making sense? You can see, okay, so she's a big deal. Um, so many different levels. Okay, we're at number three. <sighs> so we're going to get to 10, and then we're going to talk about things in, in more detail. I have too much to tell you. I'm sorry. Number three. Third. One learns so much about any society through the examination of their beliefs, especially their spiritual beliefs, if they're particularly devoted and passionate about it, as they were with the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, uh, because the cult of Artemis of Ephesia was so important to so many, the question is, why? Why is it important? What made the cult of Artemis Ephesia so important to so many, right? What, what kinds of questions did it answer, right? What kinds of needs did it meet? What kinds of day-to-day -day life did it offer to the individual, right? Why was this belief so satisfying to so many, 
Uh, we must realize that Artemis of the Ephesians herself was extremely personal, a very personal goddess. Uh, so the personal worship of Artemis Ephesia, uh, yes, was usually through veneration uh, within the family niche, you know, in your home, you had your Artemis Ephesia there. So the image again, uh, seems to be important, but you all are also involved in various public celebrations and rituals uh, through participation in her magical cult. But there's something else that's very unusual. Artemis Ephesia is not a reluctant goddess uh, from the perspective of the Ephesians and others. Uh, in fact, um, the Ephesians uh, believe that she was literally their lady. They called her Our Lady of Ephesus and very personal. They called her the Epicus. She is the goddess who, who listens, really listens to what people need. Uh, she listens to prayers of her suppliants. Um, uh, uh, Achilles Tatius writes, yesterday when I was weeping at the thought of the coming sacrifice, the goddess Artemis stood before me in a dream and said, weep no more, you shall not die for I will always be your helper, unquote. Very, very loving, very kind, which is, and compassionate, which I, I, not to play now many of the Greco-Roman gods, but some of them are, are kind, but a lot of them are not. <laughs> a lot of them are not as, as kind and sweet. This is a little unusual, right? A little bit more personal than usual. Uh, and, and then the other part is, is that uh, she is believed to be one who heals you. She was known as, uh, using the Ephesian letters, and other kinds of remedies that probably didn't work because, you know, there's medicinal reasons behind it, but they're using it under the guise of a magical aspect. Uh, she was known as a great healer. She was a, a physician that healed those who were sick. That's an important idea as, as well. Uh, she is also one who is a great rescuer. Uh, they are constantly inscribing thanksgivings to yeah. us. Uh, so uh, there's always uh, people asking that. Um, and it's funny because there's this list of Thanksgivings and there's those there's lists of people asking for help. You know, they're moving, you know, going across the sea or they're wanting, uh, you know, their fields to turn out well. And yeah, wonderful things like that. But sometimes they become really specific. I've never seen such specific prayers to any goddess. I'm going to give you an example. And you'll see, there's this one guy, his name is Eutychus. He thanked her for providing money from the temple of Artemis to help pay for a religious meal involving his sister, who was designated as the woman in charge of bringing the towel to the banquet. <laughs> Thank you, Artemis, for that long inscription. <laughs> Yeah, I tell you, just detail oriented. It's like I said, I told you, we know too much, and it's funny. Uh, but but uh, yeah, these you know for for anything you can imagine, uh, they called her Lord and they called her Kyrie. They also called her Sotoreia. They called her Savior. Uh, she was connected to a salvation called Artemis Sotoreia, uh, and there, there was even a temple dedicated to that in the Ortigia Gardens. Is this fascinating? Uh, they believe that she could save you in this life. And through the mysteries that are, are given, that you that so you are saved in the next life also, isn't that really fascinating? And again, this is unusual. If you're a Greco-Roman scholar, you're already going, yeah, wait a minute, these some of these things are pretty rare. It doesn't happen. Maybe in some instances for this one or this one, but kind of compiled together. That's that's an oddity, and it's unusual, and it does tell us quite a bit. Um, she is also known as one not only a keeper and protector, uh, but uh, she is also known as the Epiphanius. She is the one who appears. Uh, you have Artemidorus and others say that, you know, this goddess actually appears. We see her with our own eyes. And that's unusual too. In fact, they had epiphany celebrations to see the goddess that were, were important uh, at that time. Uh, and then, of course, some of the epiphany uh, 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 rituals uh, happened, it's kind of interesting, once at the full moon and once at the new moon. So they had at least one uh, twice a month. Uh, and then they had like this overnight kind of gathering. 
Uh, and during these epiphany ceremonies, uh, the temple was covered with garlands, and it's expected that people will see Artemis, whether in a dream or in real life. Is this fascinating? So you have a personal goddess. You can see this goddess. Uh, you, you can see why she's very popular. Uh, so you have lots of stories where she appears, and people go, whoa. Okay. So we're, I think we're at number four. <laughs> okay, number four. Uh, by investigating the cult of Artemis Ephesia, one realizes that this belief system is not a monolithic belief system, but was understood in many ways during the 1,500 years that it flourished. 1,500 years that it flourished. That's kind of a long time, isn't it? So it did go on, uh, for, but it does change. And one of the best ways to, to demonstrate that change uh, I give it as an example, is the, the, the cult statue of Artemis of the Ephesians. That's a good one. Take a look at the, the cult statue, which seems to be really central. And we take a look at it. And we realize that the cult statue changes its form dependent upon the age in which it appears and how it's interpreted also changes. And sometimes you have multiple interpretations, especially when you take a look at the cult statue of Artemis. The first one, uh, ancient sources will say that it is originally uh, formed out of wood. Uh, Anton Bammer, who was a renowned uh, scholar of Ephesus, uh, he's been working at the Artemisian since 1965. <laughs> he's, so. He uncovered remains of the, the cult uh, statue under the Austrians uh, that uh, predated the Croesus uh, temple that was constructed in the sixth century. So this was earlier. Uh, most of what survived are, are jewels that embellished her image, uh, thousands and thousands of them, beads, and precious ornaments, and all the myriads of trappings of a goddess. Uh, you have the necklaces, the bracelets, the golden clasps that held the goddess's robes, the golden rosettes that were once sewn upon them, uh, even the great bronze buckle, right, that gathered uh, the cloth right at the waist. The only thing we don't have is the statue because it's made out of wood. So it rotted away, but all the surrounding aspects uh, were there. All of it was there, uh, sitting there rotting in the, in the, in the earth. I, I met Anton Bammer a couple times. Uh, he looks uh, just uh, like Albert Einstein. If you Google him, you'll see. He looks like Albert Einstein. Uh, and um, we, we casually talked about all this together. Uh, and um, he's, of course, wearing shorts <laughs> and sandals, as you do when you're in Turkey. Uh, he lived there uh, full time uh, with uh, uh, his wife, Hilke. And... Um, and he came up and um, he went through my, um, which is pretty awesome. He went through my PhD dissertation. That's right. We sat together and he went through it. What an honor, right? And he's going through it and correcting it, and <laughs> you know, but hey, I, I felt a lot of confidence after that. You know, so, because we spent a lot of time uh, at the, um, uh, the New Zealand Pension, uh, which is right next to the Austrian Institute, we spent a lot of time there, uh, just going pouring over it. Uh, but uh, and he told me a few other things, which I'm going to bring up throughout the course of, of the talk. But uh, has to do with Mary. Ooh, think about Mary. So let's keep going. So and so it's wood at first, and it's interesting because it looks like that the cult of Artemis was connected with trees earlier on. The cult image. Uh, for example, Callimachus uh, gives a very nice poem that I have to read. Yeah, I, I have no choice. I'm compelled to read. Um, and it, in, in her, in, excuse me, his uh, hymn, it goes like this. For thee too, the Amazons, whose mind is set on war, in Ephesus besides the sea, established an image, uh, in Greek it's pitas, beneath an oak tree. So this image is set in front of an oak tree. And Hippo performed a holy rite for thee, and made themselves, O oh, Upas Queen, around the image, danced a war dance 
first in shields and armor, and again in a circle arrayed in a spacious choir. And the loud pipes thereto piped shrill accompaniment, that they might foot the dance together, for not yet did they pierce the bones of the fox. And the echo reached unto Sardis uh, and the Berecathinian range, and they with their feet beat, beat loudly, and therewith their quivers rattled. And afterward, around that image was raised a shrine of broad foundations. Then it shall dawn, behold, nothing more divine, not richer, easily would it outdo Pitho. Well, oh, there, literally pregnant with meaning. Uh, so the connection to the founding of sacred site of Artemis is connected to the Amazons. Are you guys seeing? We have other stories that are connected to that. So you, you, we find in Ephesus lots of very, very frees all over the place of Amazons and battles, and that was on the Temple of Artemis itself. So the Amazons are connected. They set up the sacred shrine, uh, this, this image right before the oak tree, and they do this dance, and they're hitting their, their, their shields with their swords. This action will be recreated later on in another context. We'll go there. So, but that's important for you to remember. There is a, a dance. Uh, thing, can I, can I tell you some more stuff just for fun? I just can't resist. Um, the cult of Artemis, they're really into dancing. They, really, they're so into, and um, do we know how they danced? Yes. We do. Okay. So I'm going to tell you, if you guys want to get ready, I'm going to tell you how to do the Artemis dance. Okay. We really do have an Artemis dance and it is recorded. Uh, so what you have to do, first you have to be, first of all, uh, it can be male or female because, and they call them acrobatus. All right. And, um, and what they do is first of all, you got to get on your tiptoes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you get on your tiptoes like a ballet. It gets, it gets even more hard. You have to then leap into the air a little bit and you clap. Then you have to descend all the way down on your haunches. And then you leap back up again. <laughs> and they have people doing this holding incense. I, I, I see a disaster here. <laughs> you know? but the, the incense dancers will do this. You know, so you guys got it? Tiptoe, right? Leap, clap, and thinking, how can they do that? Well, remember, it's not, it's not a little string incense. Uh, it's this handheld incense thing. Handheld, it has like a, a bulb on top. So you can, you can do the clapping. So I know you're thinking of like a little string of incense, but uh, they do have a little organized there. And then you, you go down your hunt just like a bird and you go up. In fact, they describe it as a bird dance. Okay, so yeah, so they're into dancing. And they had other dances too. Did you know that when they served the sacred meals and the offerings, the people who did so always danced. So they're dancing, holding the offerings. And they had processions of these, usually women, although um, you got some men too involved. Uh, around the companion, you had this guy who was the acrobatist for over, what was it, almost, almost 50 years. We have how long he was there. And I could, so this guy must have been in his 70s when he retired, you know, and he was doing this leaping dance. And I'm just like, the, the mental picture that, that is coming out of this, yeah, so uh, is, is pretty uh, extraordinary. But uh, again, uh, we, we, we do uh, know so much. Oh, by the way, by the way, the guy is, uh, yeah, he served from 50 to 98 CE doing these dances, and his name is Olympicus. So now you know his name. <laughs> and you know how long this guy was going on for. <laughs> so yeah, so so when you have the image of Artemis of the Ephesians, you got to think there's lots of dancing, and they have processions, and those those processions always describe the inscriptions, dancing, dancing, dancing. Is is this is this fun? You guys learning things, right? And so you can see the origin of the sacred dance goes all the way back to these Amazons, dancing around and banging their shields and so forth. The fun part also is that this idea of dancing goes into a special procession uh, that happens on, well, it happens at least twice a month throughout the year. It goes from the Temple of Artemis 
all the way out to the or sacred Ortigan Gardens and comes back. Uh, and they would have the dancing and they have singing and we have some of their songs too. Okay, well, we'll go through. I can't sing them very well, but um, I, I, I will present a few songs. Where are we at? Oh, okay. <laughs> We're still at the cult statues. So we have the wooden image, the three costs, right? Uh, and uh, what will happen is that um, is there'll be a succession of these wooden images uh, through time. And, uh, uh, and there is the association with the oak tree, but there'll be another association too that's important. Finally, the elder and others will talk about it. And that is with the castus or the ligos tree. The adex uh, castus or the li uh, ligos tree, which is not really a tree if you've ever been there. It's just like a big bush. <laughs> Yeah, and it grows all over uh, Ephesus. It grows all over the site of the temple. Uh, and it's so interesting because um, uh, it's always filled with bees. So the archaeologists try to stay away uh, from these bushes because they get keep getting stung, which is fascinating that there's so many bees around the site of the Temple of Artemis because uh, Artemis was connected to bees in many ways. So with uh, the Lagos tree, was uh, they said that the image was not made out of oak, but it was made out of a ligos tree, the, uh, the early image. Uh, and um, and it's interesting because the ligos is connected uh, to various other rituals, um, uh, to Demeter and Persephone and the Asmophoria, as well, for example. But the leaves and berries are known to, how do I say this, to lower the libido. Uh, so calm down the men, uh, but it's also known to reduce pain in childbirth. And Artemis of the Ephesians was connected to as a goddess of childbirth, and they called out to her using the, the Ephesian letters to relieve their pain as they are giving birth. And it's interesting that the Lagos was used to control that pain. So you can see that Lagos berries um, are used for other reasons too. Uh, it's used to make uh, lactate to make the mother give more milk. So they have once again, uh, Artemis is connected as to the idea of the nutrix. She's the one who nurses those she loves. So you so the Lagos is rather important to the point where Pausanias calls uh, Artemis the Lagos bound. So this is not just me just saying this. <laughs> this, this is the ancient sources say no, no, she's connected to the Lagos. <laughs> Okay, and uh, and so many people thought that maybe uh, early images of Artemis, you know, showing her wrapped, it's her being wrapped in Lagos leaves, uh, connected to uh, protection. So, uh, but she is connected to the plant world uh, as well. So that's important. So, moving right along, from there, uh, those ideas continue. And you have a great temple of Artemis that is built. Yay. But interesting point here is that uh, before the temple of Artemis was built by Croesus, uh, there were a few sacred sites that have been identified. But there's one sacred site that was associated with Artemis, who is the goddess of the moon and hunt who was the virgin goddess. And this was worshiped at this one place where the harbor used to be. Uh, and, um, and of course, obviously Cadmus and the others, this is where the Greeks had arrived and made their colonies. And this is who they worship, this, the, the traditional Artemis. To it, archeologists had found, Anton Bammer found, giving you names now, uh, they, Picture this guy looked like Albert Einstein, you know, uh, you know, going around, just woolly hair and everything. You know, uh, and they find another, and that's dedicated to the great mother goddess, dedicated to Kibbele. So she is the great mother. Well, what happens is King Croesus of Lydia, although he does not have a very happy fate, <laughs> asking the Oracle of Delphi when the Persians are at his door, hey, you know, what should I do if I attack? And of course, Oracle Delphi says a great empire will fall. He attacks. And 
equal right. Empire fell is his own, but whatever. Uh, before that, <laughs> uh, King Croesus, uh, he tore down the two structures, one dedicated to the mother goddess, one dedicated to the Greek moon goddess who, of, the, of the virgin, and he built one. And that became the Temple of Artemis, the first one. So that means that this temple was no longer dedicated uh, to simply the mother goddess, and it's no longer dedicated to simply a virgin goddess. It was dedicated to a great virgin mother goddess. You guys see a problem here? This is happening around 500 BCE. Everybody is going around worshiping a virgin mother, and they will use that word in Greek contemporaneously and after that. She's the great virgin mother. You can see where this is going to cause a problem later on when uh, early Christian legends will associate by the time we get to the to the uh, fourth century that Mary, mother of God, arrived in Ephesus and made her assumption there because, you know, last I checked, Mary is looked at as a, oh, a virgin mother. Why in the world would she go to a city that's dedicated to a <clears throat> virgin mother? You can see well, lines are going to get crossed <laughs> uh, in a traditional sense. It doesn't mean one is the other, but the result will be a blending, and we'll go into how that works. Is this fascinating? Okay. Well, then, of course, the temple uh, gets destroyed by Herodotus. Oh, let's just say that name. Uh, his name was, was forever to be blasphemed, and I said it. I'm sorry. Anyway, somebody burned down the temple. Um, the real, we know now, according to Anthony Emmer, is that he probably didn't burn down the temple. Oh, uh, yeah, poor guy. Uh, we know from inscriptions that the old temple was having problems because it's sinking into the swamp. It's having the structural integrity was going down. And they had to really well, get rid of it to build something new, built on firmer foundations. So we do have inscriptions saying, oh, we rebuilt this, rebuilt this. And we see the archaeological evidence of stuff getting a little lower than it should be. So they probably destroy their own temple to build a new one. Oh, there's lots of fun articles on this one. But, so I can say the word Herostratus and not be cursed for all eternity. Oh, by the way, the thing also is that uh, the reason why it happened is Artemis wasn't there at the time. Accordingly, Alexander the Great was born the same day it, the, the fire happened. So Artemis was was over there watching the birth. Uh, so so it's all good, you know. Hey, you know, and later on, you know, you know. Uh, <laughs> Alexander the Great arrived and says, you know what I want to do? I want to help build up this temple even more. And the Ephesians are like, oh, hey, you know, he's like, just, just, you know, inscribe my name there somewhere. Um, and that'll be great. The Ephesians are all, what are we going to do with this? Oh, I got it. Um, no, that's okay, Alexander the Great, because one god should not make dedication to another god. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, same. So a new temple was then built, uh, and it was absolutely huge. Uh, get the idea. I know we don't have a lot of time. Uh, it was uh, three times larger than the Parthenon. How's that for getting the mental picture of how big it is? Right. We'll talk more about it later, but that's, that's a big temple, huge temple. Uh, and uh, we take a look. Uh, uh, for its, uh, the statue. We're back to the statue. Well, we look at the statue and something's changing. You know, uh, first of all, you have the stone statue, which is known as the Endios statue. Uh, the Endios statue made by, well, you know, Endios. Um, some people, it, it was made out, of, made out of wood still, not really polished because it's polished so often, it started to turn black, you know. And this image uh, starts spreading uh, throughout the Mediterranean. It goes to, for example, the south of France. The Phokians bring that idea over along with a, uh, a, um, uh, a priestess of Artemis of the Ephesians. So Artemis uh, of the Ephesus is being worshipped now in, in France, and it spreads all the way up to the Paris area. I think it's very popular. So you, could, you go to the Louvre and other uh, French museums, you can see images of Artemis there. There's pretty good ones. Um, so you have, you have that. And the image again is looks looks pretty archaic, you know, you know, the big almond eyes, you know, the you know, the, the hair going down in braids, you got really stiff, you know, the typical image. Then something changes. It changes, and all of a sudden we get this polymastic image 
of Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, so, you know, we still have the almond eyes. You know, we, we have the, the fellows, the, the wonderful crown, right? Uh, and we have the, you know, the ancient looking lips, you know, like a little bit. But then you have these right over, you know, underneath, you have, underneath it, you have this area where you have the zodiac or other images connected to fertility around here. You go further down and you have these hanging clusters. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We'll say she's polymastic. And you go further down and you have registers, registers uh, of different images of wildlife, you know. So clearly there's a, a lot, of, there's a big astrology association above. And, um, and then you go further down, you have a connection with wild animals, wildlife, which you see with, with Artemis in general. But of course, you guys are going, come on, tell me about the boobs. All right. So, okay. So you have, here I see the, the breasts. And uh, do I have an answer for this? Okay. So what happened, we now have found inscriptions, yay, uh, that goes all the way back to the Hittite era. era. That's even better. Uh, and scholars at UCLA have even looked into this. Uh, in fact, um, I used some of their work. Uh, but uh, it's, what the Hittites used to do is they used to hang offerings in various places. And sometimes these offerings would end up on the cult statue. So they have, they're saying, I want to thank the goddess for this. And it's not just having to do fertility. They, they, they would say that some of these bags that they hang around uh, the goddess's neck or the god's neck were connected to magic or other kinds of ideas. Very abstract. And you hang them around these bags, hang them around the neck, and then the image itself empowers them. Uh, you know, then you could take it off. You know, Some other people, like the Swiss guy, Chapelli, right? Uh, he talks about... He also did this with bull testicles. So you have, you know, uh, this goes, of course, from the Hittite times. Now we're moving a little bit later, uh, you know, Minoans, Mycenaeans, and later than that. And the concept is, is that the fertility of the bull uh, is being transferred over to Artemis of the Ephesians, and the bull testicles are hay hung uh, from the neck. And that's why you have these protuberances hanging around. And is that possible? Of course it's possible. Uh, but eventually it will be connected to, because it's uh, at this time, Ephesus early on is connected to agriculture in the community, it will be connected to uh, products that come from the fields. So whatever there is out there, you're going to hang it around the neck of the goddess. And that you may also include the bull testicles if you want, <laughs> you know, but you're just hanging stuff, right? And we know from an inscription from the Britannium that uh, they did this also to the statue of Demeter that was there. So we do, and we have other sources that talk about them hanging things around the necks of Artemis as well as other goddesses of Ephesus. So it's kind of like, kind of a moot point, it, they did this. So, so this has to do with fertility. Well, things change. And so eventually we see that these, uh, it's really interesting, Artemis, her, her, her breasts, or sorry, her, her the hanging stuff, goes higher and up higher up her chest and goes on. Like she, it's like a breast lift or something. Uh, and then we take a look at her and they start looking like breasts. In fact, um, we have even uh, in, uh, Fleischer uh, documents a few uh, that have nipples. Well, obviously they have nipples, it's a breast, <laughs> right? Uh, we also have Minicius Felix, who was there before the temple was destroyed, as well as Jerome, also point calling them breasts. So did people think they were breasts? Well, yeah, who else thought they were breasts? The Ephesians, who says so? The Ephesians, oh, Nutrix. <laughs> He's the one who nurses them over and over again in the inscriptions. She's presenting as nursing them. So the Ephesians start moving it to this personal association. This is fascinating. So she went from, just simply an agricultural goddess, right? Where you hang your first fruits up, up as offerings, she becomes a personal one who breastfeeds you. It's the nutrix. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, but everybody believed this. Of course, not everybody believed this at that time. Because 
The great part about Artemis of the Ephesians is that people interpreted that images, image not only differently throughout time, but even whatever time you're in, they had different interpretations. Because as a universal goddess, people have different ideas of what they are. And I think that anomaly gives it an added attraction, right? So you can see oh, there's a flexibility there that is important. When it comes to the zodiac, uh, usually it is the representation uh, of, of the crab. Uh, and you're going to see, obviously, so, and, and, uh, and obviously you're going to see the signs of, uh, of Gemini sign and the Taurus and everything else. We don't have time to go over the, the, the uh, zodiac, although Aries and, and Scorpio were represented. But that's too interesting, and that would be like another talk. <laughs> yeah. So if you ever want to get my book, uh, I just want to say this. I actually put down together the entire calendar, those who haven't know, a calendar date and how the zodiac works uh, and what the sacred days are and how those days match up to our days today, which will be a little off because of, uh, you know, things are moving in the stars, so to speak. But, uh, there you have it. Um, we're at number five. How do we get to number five? What happened there? Time is going so slow. Number five. The cult of Artemis of the Ephesians gives us an insight into the forces behind ancient uh, 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 syncretistic excuse me, expressions reveal a polytheism that is rapidly becoming inclusive to the point of universals, with Artemis Ephesia herself viewed as a universal goddess. So she is... It almost seems there's a slightly monotheistic, inclusive monotheistic strain in Artemis of the Ephesians that's going on, that's popularizing these ideas at the same time that Christianity. This is interesting, right? So there are interesting points. Of course, she includes lots of goddesses within her mantle. We have Kibbele, who we just talked about, uh, who is the great mother goddess, also known as the great mountain mother. They called her the great mountain mother. That's great. In the inscriptions. And, and uh, Hibli was connected to a mountain that was near the temple of Artemis known as Mount Pion. And I have been to Mount Pion, spent a lot of time there. Uh, I've taken naps there. Uh, I've crawled into the cave and fallen asleep for a long time. I, I do a lot of sleeping. It gets hot. I'm sorry. Ephesus is hot. <laughs> and, and archaeologists take naps. They do, you know, and, you know, Sabine's always good about it. Uh, you know, we, we got to take a break. We're all going to die. We're going to continue in the later afternoon. Uh, but, um, and, and uh, yes, I have actually slept with the sarcophagus. Ooh, with the Tomb of the Seven Sleepers. Um, okay, but uh, there's a cave in the middle of Mount, Mount Pion. And uh, that uh, it was a sacred cave that I've explored. Uh, I've seen all the way up throughout the mountain uh, places dedicated to Kibbele. Uh, at Google, you can see this, uh, even carved into the side. You can see it from the Sacred Road. So Mount Pion was holy to Kibbele, and the great mountain mother uh, represented that way. Down the way, as I mentioned before, here you have Artemis, uh, who's connected also to Kibbele and also to the virgin goddess down the way. This is connected to a tree. I like this. So you got a tree over here by where the harbor used to be, and over here, which is connected to Artemis and Kibli, and over here you have a sacred site dedicated to Kibli, the great mountain mother. Are you guys following so far? Further away, you have another site, and it's a holy grove, <laughs> a sacred grove that's dedicated uh, to, well, uh, it's dedicated to various spirits, nature spirits, uh, and that's the Ortigia Gardens, uh, sprites and spirits of all kinds. Uh, and the sacred grove will also be connected up to an aspect of Kibbele. Are you guys following this? And so now you have uh, a sacred tree, a sacred mountain, and a sacred grove. Well, we're not done yet. The ancient uh, Ephesians, uh, they decided to bury their dead right along the edge, the perimeter of the sacred mountain. Uh, I was there in 2008 when Sabine Lutstadter discovered the, uh, a shrine dedicated to Hecate. 
Uh, and it turns out that uh, the whole perimeter of the mountain was dedicated to Hecate. Yeah, that's fascinating. So Hecate, of course, is the Catholic goddess, the underworld goddess, right? She is the one who connects to the dead. And she's the one carrying that torch and going down below and giving illumination. And then you have her rising up because she's declared on inscription from Ephesus, Hecate Soterea. And sometimes we see Artemis Hecate Soterea. Is this salvation? Is this not fascinating? And so the hope of the dead are at the perimeter of the mountain. Well, now this is really complicated. Now you got to, you're following this. You got a sacred tree, which will now become the temple of Artemis, the great temple uh, that uh, is one of the seven wonders of the world. You got the sacred mountain dedicated to Kibli around the perimeter, dedicated to Hecate. And over there, you have a sacred grove that will become dedicated to the place where Leto gave birth to Artemis and Apollo. So the grove is now connected to the place where Leto. In fact, as it turns out, Leto was connected as a mother goddess, but she's also connected to the various spirits within nature. And Leto is connected to the very ancient stratum that goes before so many of them, before the Minoans and before uh, the Mycenaeans. Uh, he, she goes, she is a goddess connected to Alluvians. <laughs> this is awesome. So Alipa, the Alluvian goddess. But what will happen is that she gives birth to Artemis and Apollo. And this will become the place, a tourist attraction, where everybody wants to go and uh, see the place where Artemis was born. In some cases, Apollo. Sometimes they still have them on the island. And sometimes they don't. It's, of course, the, the Ephesians, they say it all happened there. <laughs> In fact, it was such a big deal that uh, uh, they had asylum rights for the area uh, because of the fame especially around the Temple of Artemis, but also around other areas. And Tiberius Caesar, according to Cornelius Tacitus, the famous Roman historian, says, we're going to kind of reduce all these asylums. Too many people who are thieves and robbers are finding safety in these temples. And um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the envoy uh, from uh, Ephesus said, yeah, but we're the place where Leto gave birth to Artemis and Apollo. And Tiberius Caesar said, Hey, that's good enough. <laughs> that shows you how famous the Ortega Gardens were. It's just making sense. You guys got it. Okay. So, so now the here's the missing link. Uh, there was happened to be a one time a great battle. It looked like they're going to lose. Uh, this is early on in the archaic era, and so somebody tied a rope around the Temple of Artemis and tied it to the city walls. And the power of Artemis was believed to move through the rope to the city and protect the city from harm. But they got an idea. You know, we can make this a, a good deal by making our own sacred road, which is called the Via Sacra. The Via Sacra then will connect the Temple of Artemis where the tree was. It will actually lasso, go around Mount Pion. Isn't that cool? It'll go around Mount Pion. Uh, so it'll include uh, Kibli, it'll, it'll, include, it'll include also Hecate. Then on the other side, you have what's called a triadus or a three-way crossing that's dedicated to Artemis Hecate. This is where the famous library of Celsus was, uh, is, and this is where the altar of Artemis Hecate still stands. And if you don't believe me, go to the Mazius Mithradius Gate right next to the library of Celsus and take a look and you can see uh, images of Hecate. And of course, the new triadus uh, will be next to it. And then that road can go from there to the Ortega Gardens. And so the processions, the, the Via Sacra was looked at as magical. And they built altars all along this way. And the, the processions would stop at these altars, do a sacrifice, go to the next altar, do a sacrifice. And of course, they're all dancing around <laughs> twice a month. <laughs> That's a lot, a lot of times. So, so it got to the point where oh, oh no, another. So you're, you're, you figure twenty four uh, official ones every single year. You're going to get used to this after a while, right? You know, empowering uh, these areas. And what would they do basically to start the Temple of Artemis? They discovered uh, uh, in the last decade a sacred theater where they start out right next to the temple. We even found the starting point. 
goes by the Temple of Artemis. It goes around the one side of Mount Pion, inclusive, of course, the dead uh, areas, you know, because they're buried there, uh, and to the Triadus. And then it will go out over to the Ortega Gardens, and then they'll backtrack to the theater. And so the theater in, in the city itself, where, you know, the um, Demetrius the Silversmith, that one, they, they all gather there for the kind of like the after party. <laughs> and then it goes back around the other side of Mount Pion and then returns back to the temple. Is this cool? So they would do this. This is all again energizing, giving power uh, to the site. So and you're thinking we're done. Well, guess what? Uh, we also have ISIS. ISIS slips into the mix. Um, we know ISIS has been part of, I mean, you, you dig down below. And we have we actually have found uh, uh, ivories of Bess and other uh, bits and pieces connected to Egypt underneath the the Temple of Artemis before the seventh century BCE. And uh, what they do uh, is that uh, they build a what's called a seraphium. It's actually it's dedicated to seraphics and Isis along the processional route of all places that connects from the Mount Pion out to the Ortega Gardens. You go right by that, and you have an amalgamation where they will have Serapis and Artemis together side by side, not only in inscriptions, not only in huge images. I mean, we're talking really big images of the two together, but we also uh, see this in coinage <laughs> together. So this is, a, this is a, a known thing. So you can see the Isis Nutrix aspect also will blend in. And did you guys know the Ptolemies uh, had Ephesus for a period of time? They did. So it was part of uh, the Egyptian empire for a short period of time. And they did have a lot of influence, right? And of course, uh, Demeter. I, I just want to say with Demeter, I know in our minds we think Greek, 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 Demeter, you can't connect with Artemis. Yes, you can. Um, they mater, uh, right? Uh, so you, you guys know there's a connection. I won't go through the whole thing, uh, but it's connected to obviously the idea of mater, mother, right? And of course, it is the mother goddess, and you have that the concept there. And the Ephesians saw that connection. So you, Demeter is Artemis from their perspective. Who said so? The Ephesians say so. Where in their inscriptions? Where else? The Britannium. Where else? They have a statue dedicated to it. Oh, wow. <laughs> Too much information. Okay, moving right along. So. You can see that she's an amalgamation of all these things, and you're going to think, well, why not Mary? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we go, because she's already open to all these aspects. Let's go to number six. Wow, number six. We realize, number six, that the sacred geography of the city of Ephesus itself directly influenced how Artemis Ephesia was understood and even how she developed. Thank goodness, I just did that. Heart <laughs> before the horse. Whew, good. Okay. We covered that. Yeah. Number seven. While this belief was one of the most important in the Greco Roman era, today this belief system is no longer prevalent. And the importance here to, is to ask the question what happened? Just what happened to one of the most powerful cults of antiquity? And so the study becomes important in that it investigates how a religious belief begins, grows, becomes dominant, changes, and then gradually dies or transforms into something else. Ooh. Okay, number eight, uh, the study of the cult of Artemis Ephesia challenges scholars to dramatically reinterpret the importance of the role of women within an ancient Greek and Roman context. Women were large and in charge, seriously, Big time in the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, you know, you do have uh, many uh, women who are leaders, uh, writing hymns and, and head of the priesthood and so forth. Um, uh, you're going to have a uh, uh, body of Trophimi, uh, who's very important, uh, who's not only uh, the high priestess, but later on she becomes in charge of the Britannian. Uh, and you have others that will become the priestess of all Asia. Many of the women from there, they start off uh, uh, doing, you know, decorating the image of Artemis, and then they move into the high priestess, and then they move to the Pertain, and then they move to be an Asiarch. 
That's kind of a big deal, the imperial cult all the way up. By the way, uh, hardly any other province shows this, this uh, fluidity of women in these positions. Women uh, were very powerful. A lot of the buildings, take a look at the inscriptions around, around Ephesus, were paid for by these wealthy women who are connected to, the, to not only the imperial cult, but also the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, so we have, uh, I'll give you a name because I'm, I'm big generalities. So I get, oh, I can't use specifics. Um, Media Marcia, there we go. Um, she was high priestess of Artemis between 93 to 100. Uh, then she moved up to Britannus, and then she became the high priestess of all Asia. There, now you have a name. Hold on to. Um, now, Artemis was also involved in protecting women, very protective of women in every way. Uh, protecting women. Uh, she's considered the great virgin goddess. So she's very protective of women's virginity, but she's there all along with women. Uh, she's there to protect women in childbirth. She's then there to, to make sure that girls are taken care of. And if they're not taken care of, there's ways to take care of them elsewhere, uh, being given to the temple if they have no parents. Are you guys getting this? Right? Other, other possibilities. And then we know that um, Artemis is connected to menstruation, and she's connected to, um, uh, which is really fascinating, uh, when it comes to puberty. Uh, I'll have to read this because it's too good. Okay, and puberty is my book, so I'm quoting myself. <laughs> okay, at the time of puberty, when menstruation began, the maiden put on a special girdle to mark the occasion. While a tampon was made by wrapping linen around a small piece of wood. Ooh, anyway, the first girdle was later offered to Artemis after their first after their first sexual encounter, giving the goddess the epithet. Uh, Lizomis, which means the releaser of the girdle. Of course, besides a girdle, the maiden soon-to-be woman was required to make other offerings to purchase her freedom from the goddess, who was not always eager to release her, <laughs> reluctant to free her of her maiden side. Uh, and uh, Artemis um, uh, also untied a few more girdles on other occasions, too. On the women, women's official wedding night, if you guys know, wait, Women's official wedding night, another girdle. This is wait, there's a there's a one girdle and there's another girdle between oh boy. <laughs> uh only af after asking Artemis uh was she allowed, and the spouse has to ask all of the has to ask Artemis, can I can I ungirdle her? There's even a fun ceremony. I know I'm running out of time. There's even a fun ceremony. Where the person is about to get married, and she what she does is she ritually runs to the temple of Artemis, and she holds on to the pillar, and he's supposed to try to pull her away from it. Of course, she goes, "Oh, I let go." <laughs> I just, I guess you can't make this up. I wish people knew this information. It's driving me crazy, you know. All right, okay. So even the small little things, um, but uh, and and so yeah, women are very important. And so moving on, my my. Understanding the cult of Artemis Ephesia is fundamental to understanding the development of early Christianity. Now we're going to get some eyebrows and raising up here. Now, understanding what the beliefs related to Artemis of the Ephesians, uh, as well as Christians, we can now chart a gradual shift in Christianity as it moves from toleration in the first and second centuries to a gradual lack of toleration in the third century to downright persecution during the fourth century. By tracking, those who deem Christianity should return to its roots will realize through so many sources, they would then have to not only be tolerant of the belief system of Artemis of the Ephesians, but uh, that they also have to be tolerant of other religions as well. Did you guys realize that when it, when it came to the, the belief system of Artemis of the Ephesians, they were very tolerant. Early Christian sources are all, well, let it be, let it go. Yeah, even in the book of Acts, the town clerk is like, he's not, he's not going against our goddess. He's just going against the image idea. You know, even we, many many of the pagans at that time were against images. You guys getting that? But, but Paul's not against that. How that slipped into the New Testament, I have no idea. But it got in there. And that idea continued into... Uh, going into the second and into the early third century. It's fascinating to study this. So you don't find any harsh words. They just kind of 
live and live until we get to the fourth century when religion and the state mix together. Then it becomes a whole other issue altogether. So you don't mix politics with religion, basically. Um, and then, but otherwise, the Christians will live and let live when it comes to the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians. Ten, also in relation to Christianity, uh, the belief for the cult, not a cult, but the cult of Artemis of Ephesia did not completely disappear. An aspect of it continued on and trans transformed into the cult of the Virgin Mary. Yes, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to give you some details on this. And I want to talk about a few other things really quickly. You give me some time. Uh, but uh, this is kind of a huge deal. So basically this. Where does this idea come from? It comes actually from the Gospel of John. What? Yeah, I know. Jesus looks down from the cross and says to John the Apostle, all the other disciples abandoned him. You know, you got three women and you got John sitting there. <laughs> Peter's not denying. Uh, uh, he says, behold your mother. So from there on out, wherever John went, Mother Mary was said to go out also. You guys follow that? Well, of course, many scholars say most likely Mary died in Jerusalem. That's not the point. Most scholars agree that a John, some John, there are sometimes multiple perspectives of which John wrote the Gospels, the Epistles, and the Book of Revelation. Anyway, we still have evidence from the second century that John went to Ephesus. You know, Irenaeus of Leon says so. Clement of Alexandria says so. Oh, wait, I'm giving you sources. I know. John went to Ephesus. So the assumption is, then, well, if we read this, Mary must have gone with him. Are you guys getting that? That's the assumption. Not a great place for Mary to go if she went there because they're worshiping a great virgin mother, <laughs> which doesn't seem to be a problem in the first couple of centuries because they're not thinking about virgin mother as early Christians believed uh, that they, you know, which he had, of course, other, other you know, brothers, right? Except the proto-evangelism of James, the rest say, yeah, he's got brothers there. Okay, so are you guys following that, right? So that virgin idea is not that big. But meanwhile, Artemis is looking kind of interesting. You have Our Lady of Artemis, and she starts having a veil around her head, which is fascinating. If you take a look at her images, her hands are like this. Take a look at those hands. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's fascinating. And then they, the inscriptions are constantly saying, you know, well, obviously, Virgin Mother. As we go along, this image now is on their coins. Yes, we got coins that looks just like Mary, and it's Artemis. That is in circulation. <laughs> and by the way, I have one of my books. You can take a look at it for yourself. You can see it. And, and she's becoming more and more, how do you say that, more and more looking like a veiled virgin uh, as time goes on. Well, what happens is that um, in the fourth century, you got uh, a group of Christians that saw Mary as a goddess. That's not so important, but there's a beginning of the elevation of Mary. And by the time we get to the later part of the 300s, they start saying, you know what? John went there. Mary went there, too. Now, all of a sudden, the trappings of Artemis and its belief systems start to merge with the Christian ideas of how to venerate. Artemis. They had these Ephesian letters, they had these beads that represented, of course, the, the, uh, the processional route. And of course, each bead, Artemis and Ephesian, you know, you go through it. You know, Buddhism has these, you know, everybody has these beads. Everybody loves beads. <laughs> uh, so be all of them. But, uh, but this is connected also to Artemis because the Ephesian letters were connected to uh, these amulets that have beads. Are you, guys, are you guys getting this already? So, so these ideas start to mix up, and they and um, meanwhile you have the prohibition of paganism, and everybody in Ephesus is still worshiping Artemis. We got to do something. So they go, okay, we'll just switch over. <laughs> same rites, same kind of offerings. You know, under Artemis of the Ephesians, they always poured. It's really thick and, and has a lot of aftertaste. Is Pramenian wine dedicated to Artemis? We'll just do that for Mary. You know. Uh, we always have, you always have the uh, frankincense we burn for, for, for Artemis, which we'll do it for Mary. <laughs> you know, it's, it's business as usual, just a little bit of notice, sleight of hand. Um, and, and so in popular culture, and then what are you going to do when it comes to various places? Like the Serapium was dedicated to 
Serapis, Isis, and of course, Isis as Artemis. What are you going to do? There, it's going to be dedicated according to an inscription, dedicated to John and Mary, of course, church. Then another place and location, you have the Olympian, uh, that there'll be another church dedicated to Mary. And as Anthony Hammer told me, you know, the guy I just told you about earlier, you know, the Albert Einstein guy, they found that the Temple of Artemis was, was mostly destroyed. Uh, 262, it suffered a lot of damage. 261, 62, earthquake, goths, terrible things. It was rebuilt in a smaller way. But uh, by the time you get to the time of John Chrysostom, 401, 402, uh, it's, it's in ruins. But the leftovers were turned into a church dedicated to Mary. The very site. And if you think you're not convinced yet, that's okay. Because there's a Council of Ephesus. At the, in the year 431, there's a Council of Ephesus. And, you know, it was a strategic move. Uh, they knew uh, there's a debate between is Mary the mother of God or is Mary the mother of Christ? You know, is she Theotokolos or is she Christotokolos? What is she, you know? Uh, is she mother of God, mother of Christ, you know? And, and they pulled the debate there. What do you expect you're going to hear? <laughs> so all the people, all the, the people in the streets are, to, mother of God, mother of God, mother of God. Guess what the decision made? Mary becomes mother of God, and all those features and aspects of the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians get hooked on to Mary, and right away, those trappings go right to Rome, church of Santa Maria de Magiola, which is built soon after. This is fascinating and spreading throughout Byzantium. So it is mixed together. <laughs> How's that? So fun, fun stuff. Uh, probably too many, too many uh, fun things talked about. Uh, I do want to uh, finish off just a few uh, little thoughts here. Uh, I do want to mention that um, we do know uh, exactly, uh, you know, uh, the, how they did their uh, the rituals. And I, I know I don't have a lot of time, but I just want to mention uh, a few here. Read this my notes. You know, oh yeah, here's. I just want to read it from the description here about the sacrifices, so you have some more information. Told you the processions go on. When it comes to sacrifices, I'm just reading uh, an inscription from Ephesus just to give you the idea how detailed they are. The all prevailing, reasonable fate goddess and father of the head capital dictate that all embracing sacrificial laws be decreed. Pertain should light all the altar fires and should perform incense sacrifice. And for the cult, should set certain days for animal sacrifices. 365 in all. Of these days, 190 days should be restricted to taking out the heart and cutting off the thigh. On the remaining 175 days, however, whole animal should be dedicated, and he is to be sure he is capable of his duty, whereby the expenses of the city is to be arranged by the Hierophant, who is also to instruct everyone at the meeting on the regulations concerning the worship of the goddess, as well as to provide advice. This is, kind of, this is pretty detailed. So that means that you have Olympian sacrifice for, uh, for well, how many days? Um, uh, 190 days and a, and a chthonic sacrifice for 175 days. That means there's a sacrifice dedicated to Artemis. How many days? Every single day of the year. That place was going, right? And you're thinking, well, what are they doing? Okay. Here we go. The Pertain, that's the guy who's in charge. And the Hierophant, uh, he's the guy who does the mysteries, should receive the heart, tongue, and fur coat from every sacrificial animal as a gift because of their expense. So they can, you know, they're not going to keep all that. <laughs> you know, it's like, hey, got another fur coat uh, for you, honey. You know, that's good. you know, they're going to sell it and use it for other things, right? Uh, as well as their servants. The Hierophants, that is the person that makes the announcements. Uh, the spondylus, the flute player by the drink sacrifice, the hieros pikes, the trumpet blowers, and the two hierophantin, and it goes on. Oh, hieroscopus, the intensive shower, uh, and, the, and the seven uh, curatin should receive a, a present appropriate to their role by the cold action. Isn't that nice? Everybody gets something. But however, the single leading regulation, I love this. This is one of my favorite parts of the inscription, is that the pertain should stay out of debt. <laughs> <laughs> money management 
<laughs> that's so bad that, that, that you know you pretend you're elected each year you have to contribute at least five thousand sesterces to to buy the position <laughs> because they, they gotta get the money from somewhere <laughs> and then you're supposed to you know donate all this other for all the called actions they even have regulation for the hymn uh hymn singers uh how much money you have to if money makes the world go around but stay out of debt um, he's he's a he's a also should an opponent decorate other uh, statues and uh, uh, Demeter the Pretanium with fruit produced from the fields. Hey, look, there's the inscription, as well as the masters of the temple. Isn't that beautiful? You know, so you have all that, and so uh, we do know how they did other offerings. We do know what order they did this in. Um, we do know that when they approached the temple of Artemis, they went up this ramp. Uh, that was there, uh, and going up to the place of the cult action, uh, and this, uh, this this altar uh, was positioned right in front of the Temple of Artemis, and right above there's the Epiphany window, and when the, the sun was a cer certain direction, it would bounce off an image in the Epiphany window and would radiate right down into the altar at a certain time, twice a day. Cool. Uh, and uh, during this time of the cult action. Meanwhile, uh, the priest would be sitting there officiating, uh, doing the various uh, sacrifices uh, as they go through this. Um, yeah, and then of course, obviously, uh, we have uh, uh, other bits and pieces, but um, uh, I, of course, I'm, I'm running uh, out of time pretty quickly. Uh, so what I'll do, is is I will say this is that a few uh, kind of summing up things. I will mention that the Temple of Artemis, here it is. Uh, originally, the Temple of Artemis was under the Hierarchs, sorry, under the the Holy uh, a, a male. Uh, let me say this: a male priest and a, of course, obviously a priestess. This was at first, uh, and uh, the Mega business was the male priest. The problem is, is that he had to be uh, celibate, and the art, people of Ephesus didn't believe in celibacy. So, uh, what happened is eventually they had to use outsiders all the time as the male priest. It didn't go over very well. Uh, so, they decided to change things around. But originally, the Temple of Artemis, uh, as far as organization is concerned, uh, you had a priest and a priestess. Uh, you had various levels of uh, priestesses you had for example uh, those uh, who are the, the those who are the to the, the initiate for the learners and those who are the practitioners and then when you retire you end up being according according to the belief system the teachers you also had three layers of male as well as female priests called the neophy was the those who are the managers the Essenes were those who were in charge of the celebrations, and the Curities were in charge of the mysteries. But then around 31 to 30 BCE, Augustus Caesar had Vidius Polio. What he did is split up the belief system, where uh, the Temple of Artemis had some officials, and the city hall, the Britannium, uh, had others. Uh, so you had kind of a, a split uh, in the organization. But the funny part is, is that somehow the two ends work together because that sneaky via sacra brought them all together as one, and the belief system thrived, and uh, and was the passion of so many for so many generations. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave you with a hymn, uh, the words from a hymn. Uh, written by the high priestess as well as the pertain and um, and the hymn goes as follows and this is where I'll close up and this is dedicated to to Artemis let her satisfy the blessed deities let her preserve the fiery light of the city. To you, sweetest spirit, new shoot of the cosmos, ever streaming light, to you who preserve on altars 
a spark from heaven. Thank you. Uh, so much, so much to cover. There's so much I wanted to say, but there's just not enough time. But you get, you get the idea that we know uh, so many, so many details. Uh, uh, it gets to be uh, kind of kind of ridiculous after a while. I did, did want to mention I did find it so, on the source right after I, I did this. Uh, the, if you guys want to know the processions, who's in what order, I just want to throw this one out. Uh, to the altar of Artemis, this happens, of course, every single day. Young maidens were at the front carrying baskets that contained the sacrificial tools, including knives and axes, along with incense, which is usually frankincense, and other needed uh, supplies and utensils. The musicians follow the maidens, uh, and after, uh, after that, uh, the sacrificial animals covered with garlands, and then the, then the priest. And then for some strange reason, they had the flute players separate from the other musicians after the priests. And then you have the performers of the sacrifice, and then everybody else follows in the profession. So it kind of gives you a, an idea. Uh, by the way, the great altar in front of the Temple of Artemis had stalls for 20 oxen. And so it was a very grandiose uh, slaughterhouse, uh, and um, which is fascinating. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, we have found the bones of the various animals, uh, goats, cattle, gazelles, hares, bears, lions, sheep, pig, donkey, do dogs, deer. We find it all. But they sacrificed so many that it was the place uh, where people got their meat. It was the slaughterhouse for, for all of, of Ephesus. And only later on, as we get into the third century, was there another meat area? So if you bought your got your meat in Ephesus, it was always sanctified by Artemis. This caused a problem amongst certain people, obviously, because if you're a Christian, you can't eat meat as sacrifice to images. This is making sense, which made Christians uh, either, either eating fish or vegetarian or finding meat elsewhere. Fascinating. And we have some references to this. So just some other little details I'm throwing in. Um, but, uh, any questions? I had one question. Well, you partly answered it about the incense. You said frankincense. Do you know, were there any other kinds of incense that were they commonly used? Um, frankincense was, uh, and um, amber was another. Oh. Yeah, I know. It's very strange. Amber? Yeah, amber. Amber is actually the earlier one. Okay. Yeah. So Amber and frankincense. Yeah. And the wine is really good. I, I like the wine. You know, I know. They still grow it, by the way. Still, it's still, yeah. It's, 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 you know, you know, uh, well, the cult of uh, the, the basis of Artemis of, of Ephesus, uh, they had, um, you know, let's go to the commercial aspect. They had um, frankincense stores at incense stores. And we found an inscription uh, that talked about a person renting one of these. <laughs> and and they also had wine shops and those are located all over the place. So you go and you buy your Artemis wine that was sanctified by Artemis. So yeah, there's a commercial aspect. Also, you can get Artemis fish. They had some sacred ponds uh, nearby because the, the harbor was retreating, leaving little ponds behind. Uh, and this is on, on the land. Uh, and so you can get some, uh, some nice Salinas uh, sanctified fish that was considered holy. And so so they're in the fish business. You got to make money. Yeah. In fact, uh, the mega business, uh, the, the male uh, high priest, he got rid of his position, as I mentioned. Uh, and um, they had the pretend in, in, in the pretendium in charge. But the mega business was in charge of the treasury. So they gave it to somebody else uh, because they thought he had too much power. And the treasury was very, very involved in making sure that the revenues kept coming in. <laughs> you got to make money. You got to be creative. And so, and so sure, they get a lot of money for the pilgrims, but they figured out other ways too. 
So uh, there are other establishments on the side of the Temple uh, of um, uh, Artemis. They held a gymnasium <laughs> and um, in, a, in a place and other shops that were to facilitate that all the money went there. And yeah, it's, it's fun. Hey, any questions? It's all my book, by the way. <laughs> Makes you want to read it, though. No, it's all there. And, and, and all the, uh, it's all documented so you can see the inscription. In many cases, I have the inscription in Greek in the bottom, so you can look for yourself or, or where to find the inscription. So I'm very big on documentation. So, but we know exactly how the priestly hierarchy operated, we know how it changed. I have the names of everybody, you know. I mean, the question really is, what else do we need to know for certain periods of time? What else do you want to know? <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Any other question? Oh, maybe that's it. Have I, have I to use a uh, 1920s phrase, have I flabbergasted people? <laughs> Uh, may I ask you something about the eligibility for office? Can you tell us a bit, a little bit more about that? Thank if you so much. Kind of Great. In the family or something like that. Okay. So when it came to, let's, let's start with the priestesses. Uh, when, it, when it came to priestesses, uh, you, you first of all have uh, priestesses that moved all the way up from being simply slaves of the goddess uh, and they moved up the hierarchy uh, doing various duties uh, some not, not as, as pleasant the garland hangers and so forth and you move up uh, to be the, the one who connects to the jewelry or the outfits of, of, of Artemis you decorate that that's actually the highest level and then you of course go up from there you can become a, a priestess or whatever it is but in other cases you come from a wealthy family and you want your daughter to be a, a, a priestess. Uh, it was established, and then they put it in stone in the, in the, in the 160s CE. It's going to cost you 5,000 sesterces. <laughs> and so you pay for admittance. Uh, so there is there is a, a pay. So so you're going to have a situation where this uh, slave girl who worked all the way, way up, you know, I'm getting there, you know, and then the rich people will go, yeah, ooh. She's over you now. <laughs> oh, great. That's like because they pay the money, and but at the same time, uh, that uh, many of these uh, these uh, priestesses, many of them uh, were independent in their own right. Uh, so so they will find the names as a priestess, but we'll find also that they dedicated buildings, uh, even though the idea is they're supposed to be. Um, you know, virgins, that idea went out the window pretty quick, especially when I see inscriptions, and I have a few of them documented, where it says, you know, high, you know priestess of Artemis and her husband, the name, <laughs> kind of ruins that. So uh, so you could have the situation, too, of, dad, you know, husband goes, hey, you know, so dad goes, hey, daughter, you want that position? And also a, a husband goes, hey, you want that position? Uh, and, some, and they work together because that's a, that's a point of patronage. So you have, um, have that. There are other ways that people achieved office, and that is um, through the various, uh, uh, through the city uh, system. Uh, there's various positions that people hold and they move up and to be pertain on the city side was a big deal. But it was by two ways. You were elected and you pay some money. What is fascinating is before the reform of polio, you're a mega business for life, male priest. You are a high priestess for life. After the reform, uh, it's, it's one year in my election and you pay. So, so goes, uh, thank you so much for asking that question. So then, you know, he had the sense of, of it's a popularity contest, you know, uh, it's involved, right? Who has the most money? And, but at the same time, also, who is the most, um, um, who is fit in some cases? Because there is an election process. And the bull, B-O-U-L-E, oftentimes did the voting. But in some cases, uh, the voting went outside of that, into various assemblies. So, 
So you get voted in. Okay, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. And the, and the, and the link for your book in the chat. Oh, are you going to do that? Available on Amazon. Yeah, available on, on Amazon. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, An excellent Christmas gift, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they, they even had a, a the fest, Feast of Artemis Atis, where uh, you have uh, young, we have kids, basically, uh, really too, too young. Uh, basically, you have young maidens uh, and young men going to the seashore. And they're dressed in, in ritual outfits, and they, of course, taking with them the image of Artemis. Uh, and they collected uh, parsley, and they collected uh, celery and uh, seeds, uh, and they collected um, garlic. And that was, in turn, brought back uh, to the goddess. Actually, the women did that. The men, they, um, they gathered salt. So, uh, so the men did the salt, the women did all the others. And then they come back and they do a great offering there. So you already know that now parsley, celery, and garlic all used in ancient medicine. They all have medicinal aspects, a lot of uh, pain relievers uh, and curatives done in a certain way. Then what happens uh, is one, one year, the, the guys forgot the salt. And of course, Artemis is real angry and <laughs> forget the salt. We got to make sure you do it right. Anyway, so yeah, there's lots, lots, lots of celebrations. Um, I got you. Got to hand it to the Greeks and Romans. They, they did have a uh, nice share of celebrations year round, and the Artemis, Art, the people of Ephesus like the party more than most. So, and uh, I know a lot of the cults are all kind of you know, wearing white, but uh, the the high priestess was wearing purple, and she had a jeweled crown and fancy outfits. In fact, people made fun of the Ephesians because they thought they were too Persian. Uh, they're too much into their elaborate, colorful outfits. Uh, it was too loud. Uh, because remember, the Persians, uh, the royal road started at Ephesus, went all the way uh, to Persepolis and Susa. You know, at Pony Express, it only took about, you know, you know, three weeks to get from one, two weeks to get from one to the other on 111 postal stations. Anyway, so Persian influence was really big at Ephesus. So they're into the elaborate stuff. So the cult of Artemis of the Ephesians was pretty beautiful to look at. You know, wearing wearing plumes and great outfits, and we see this in various images. So, yeah, so it's a pretty, <laughs> pretty belief system. <laughs> it all has all the trappings, and it, I think also, I think it appeals. Uh, it, it, the personal aspect, I think that people. It's important when it comes to Christianity. I think people were seeking after personal religion, with uh, with 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 God or goddess during the first century. I think there's this really this movement that they, they don't want to have cold rituals anymore. They want to have a relationship with, 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 with deity, uh, a personal one. And you're going to see this even in Judaism too at this time. There's this personalization. Uh, they're living long enough uh, and uh, to, you know, they're, not, they're not, no longer dying at the, you know, at, at 30. So it's not only, it's not like survival of the fittest, situation with each you know i'm going to die anyway so i just you know make sure I, i'm able to eat make sure i have a roof over my head and clothes uh what's going to happen is it's, it's going to be like hey i'm living long maybe i'll start thinking philosophically <laughs> where am i going <laughs> you know maybe i want to have a relationship i'm living long enough uh and people get start getting restless they want more from their beliefs and i think that's why christianity was also popular uh, is they want to have a, a personal connection and they want to they want to have a universal connection and they don't want all these difficult rituals to get in the way. And I think that the, art, the, the belief system Artemis of the, of the Ephesians is contemporaneous to that era, that same era looking for personal religion. And you're going to see exactly the same thing in the cult of Isis. I will start moving through in the, in the, right, in the first and second century. So there's this need that the, uh, you know, our God or our goddess needs to do a little bit more. <laughs> yes. well, I have to totally get into a goddess who is kind and caring with fabulous clothes and lots of dancing. Like, sign me up. Too much dancing. 
<laughs> um, you know, trying to practice. It, it, some people compared it uh, to uh, an, a kind of form of ballet uh, because you're you're on your tiptoes and you're jumping in the air and clapping and then going all the way down. Uh, you know, a, a picture that one met was it 45, 50 years that one old guy doing this. <laughs> if I had arthritis, you probably just went half punch. <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's funny because we know their names, and I can picture them sitting around doing the cult actions. You know, uh, the one guy, he'll, he, they, they, the Howard Kirk, he'll make the announcement, you know, oh, by the way, later on, it'll be a woman. Uh, there should be a few women who will be the announcer. So that changes. But uh, usually for the announcer, they have the best singers. So I've actually looked at inscriptions and they won singing contests. <laughs> it's like, hey, you'd be perfect as a hierarchy. So they sing, call people in. And then you have the person playing the flute, you know, over the drink offering. And you have, of course, the guy dancing around with the incense, you know. And you have the person, of course, reading the entrails. And then, of course, you have the hierophant leading people into the mysteries uh, if they want to. Uh, and, uh, but they all, like I said, they're just, they're just like one of us. You know, sitting sitting around each other year after year. Uh, you know, the dream team that I just mentioned earlier, uh, which I've lost the page now, um, of, of these common names. Where did they go here? Oh, lost it. Okay. Like I said, we know the names of these people, and we know, uh, you know, basically it'd be like familiar, like going around going, hey, Earl, how's it going today? <laughs> It's okay, Tom, you know, because remember, they're stuck with each other 365 days. And they're serving together for 30 to 40 years. Is that incredible? I hope they get time off. <laughs> you know, I really, when you, think, when you think about it, I hope they got uh, some time off to, to do something else uh, other than, um, um, you know, doing the ritual. Oh, yeah, here it is. Thing. So. So basically, it would be like, um, uh, so, uh, uh, Medotas, Medotas, how are you doing? Oh, I don't know. Uh, Metras, hey, Marcus, are you doing okay? They're basically doing that for 40 years. And we have, we have the same list of names for the Temple of Artemis, too. So they have their own hierarchies, and they're talking. So I love how much information we have. Again, we have too much information. No more questions? I got to answer it. You got to ask me anything. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, um, if, if there's it's no. probably an obvious question, but it was in uh, modern day Greece, right? The Ephesus. So, so Ephesus is located in Turkey today. Okay. Uh, it is on uh, along the coast of the Mediterranean. And there is so much to see there. Uh, it's ab absolutely amazing. Except the Temple of Artemis is not much. Usually uh, they, they put together a one remaining pillar and it's not the, even the right height and there's always a stork's nest on top. So, so much for the glory days of Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, I like to go there and look at all the frogs jumping around, uh, around, around May. There's all these little frogs that are in the ruins in the pond area. It's turning in the marsh. They try so hard to it's just not working out. And the march just keeps coming back in. There's lots of little, little fun uh, pond frogs. Uh, but but uh, there's neat stuff to see elsewhere. <laughs> there's the library of Celsus that's there. You got a beautiful theater that's standing. You got the, the temple of the mission uh, that's that's largely there. You have a beautiful Odeon. Um, yeah, so there, there are things to be seen. A lot of giant uh, bathing establishments that are still there. Uh, so uh, it is worth going uh, if you can get there, and uh, it's the surrounding is 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 beautiful. You got vineyards. I love it there. You uh, they have a they grow a lot of peaches, so the peach trees surround the area, and it's great to be there around the, the later spring because you know you just grab a peach, and water comes out of the peach everywhere, and people are really friendly. And it's really cheap to stay there. So if you go, uh, if you're right next, I've always had places right next to the Temple of Artemis. And I've stayed uh, for $10, $15 a night. 
<laughs> in some cases, I've saved money by being in Turkey <laughs> and come back with a surplus. <laughs> so what you do is you eat the food in the market area, stay away from the tourist traps. Uh, you, you, you stay with, with friends or stay at these cheaper places as long as you don't mind having a bump near somebody else uh, and just enjoy yourself. So uh, thank you, Joan, for being here. So, yeah. So anyway, it's, it's in Turkey. But it was part of the Greco-Roman Empire, I guess, at that time. So, yeah, so it's part of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the uh, yes, uh, the influences of Ephesus are, are really a mixed you do have uh, Luvian. You do uh, remember uh, under the Hittites, it was the ancient capital known as Apossus uh, of the Luvians. So the Hittites record this. Uh, and, and of course, they, the Luvians, it talks about the Hittite records talk about that a great star fell at Apossus, which was one of the Luvian capitals. That's fascinating to me because uh, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, it talks about the image of Artemis coming down from heaven. Well, that legend goes all the way back to the time of the Hittites. So yeah, so there's connections there. And then you have influence that's coming from the Minoans. Uh, uh, Sabine Ladstadter discovered a Minoan site there. The Mycenaeans were there. There's a Mycenaean tomb. Uh, and then of course, the then later on, you're gonna have uh, uh, the Lydian kingdom uh, and then the Persians, obviously. And then uh, you're going to have, of course, the Greeks back and forth. The Greeks were there uh, before the Persians, and then they lose it, and then they gain it again, and then they lose it, and gain it again. It's just Greek history. <laughs> it's called Ionia. Uh, and then eventually uh, it will become a part of the uh, Persian again, and then the, Perg the Pergamene uh, uh, kingdom, and following that, uh, the last Pergamese king. Uh, Attalus dies and he donates to Rome and it becomes part of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Yeah. And then it'll become part of the Eastern Roman Empire, which is known later on as Byzantium. The city of Ephesus will, will thrive for a while, but it keeps changing sites, so different locations. So they keep moving it to different locations. But uh, yeah, there's quite a bit to see. Any other questions? So go to Turkey. Yeah, Dorian put a really nice link to the ruins in the chat. Oh, good. Oh, good. Wonderful. Yeah. So anyway, I would love to um, write another book on this. <laughs> so, um, but, um, you know, I, there's so much more I could even add to this current book. I've done even more research. I would love to do more work on the origins of Artemis and the Ephesians going into the Luvians and the Mayanoans and the Mycenaeans really going into the um, uh, the late bronze era in detail because I see so many in interesting connections not only to this belief system but transitions uh, within the state of religion uh, and how people do things so that would be a fascinating study and I also I did a talk here already on Artemis of Perge Artemis of and I'd love to do that talk again and all my sources, one person will get, will, will get this. All my sources were in German. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, the interesting part about it is Artemis of Perge, uh, apparently uh, the English-speaking world hasn't discovered it yet. But it is a direct link with Artemis of the Ephesians, and it links us all the way back to the ancient Luvians. So it's a really cool leftover uh, from that era. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much uh, for being here. I hope it was fun. Ice is next time.